Thanks, Sunny. Uh, I'm just going to uh, share my screen now. It might just take a second here. Uh, uh, okay, can everybody see that all right? I'm just going to put it in presenter mode. Yeah, that looks good, Dustin. Okay. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, anthracnose. Uh, do we have resistance or not? So um, I did a project um, over the summer and into the fall. Um, testing um, a few uh, isolates of, uh, of uh, colototricum, uh, which is the causal agent uh, for anthracnose, uh, which was funded um, by the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture. So, um, so a little bit about the Nova Scotia strawberry market. Um, so the farm gate value uh, in 2021 uh, was $11 million uh, from fresh fruit. Uh, we also have a $12 million nursery plant uh, industry in the province. And a third of the 12,000 acres of strawberries grown in Florida um, are actually from Nova Scotia. Um, and 80% of uh, fruiting strawberry plants in Nova Scotia, are, Nova Scotia are sourced from local nurseries. So it's a, it's a very large and, and very important industry for the province. Um, so a little bit about the pathogen. Um, so anthracnose is caused um, by a few different pathogens um, in the colototricum um, um, genus. So we have uh, um, a species complex that causes um, anthracnose fruit rot. Um, so those include colototricum acutatum, colototricum nymphae, and colototricum uh, fiorinae. Um, and then there's also uh, colototricum uh, fragari and colototricum uh, gliosporoides. Um, so this is just a, a photo of, of kind of what the spores of, uh, of um, colototricum look like under the microscope. Um, so this is a, um, just a, um, a phylogeny of the, of the colototricum species. So you can see um, the ones that cause disease on strawberries. So we have uh, up at the top, colototricum nymphae, um, colototricum acutatum, um, and then down below, um, colototricum fiorinae. Um, so those are part of the, the complex that causes anthracnose fruit rot. Um, so colototricum acutatum usually causes fruit rot. Um, colototricum uh, fragari can cause crown rot, uh, petiole and um, runner lesions and black leaf spot. And colototricum um, uh, gliosporoides can cause um, crown rot and uh, irregular uh, leaf spot. So anthracnose uh, is a disease um, that occurs wherever strawberries are produced. So um, the disease occurs sporadically and its importance can vary greatly from year to year. So in some years, the disease is incredibly destructive, uh, resulting in plants with reduced productivity, unmarketable fruit with lesions and even plant death. Um, in years when disease is severe, 100% of the fruit may be unmarketable and whole pla uh, plantings uh, may succumb to the disease in the right conditions. Um, in other years, anthracnose is a minor issue and may be difficult to find in the field. Um, so that's kind of like what I had talked about. So uh, it's a necrotic fungus and attacks uh, fruit runners, petioles, and crowns. Um, so um, infections can occur on green or ripe fruit and present themselves as brown or black sunken circular lesions. Um, so these lesions are distinct and fairly small, so they're no larger than about uh, uh, one and a half uh, centimeters or um, three fifths of an inch in diameter. So their salmon colored spore masses ooze from these lesions in humid conditions. So that's a, a really good indicator um, that you have um, anthracnose on fruit is that you actually see that salmon color spore mass. Um, a lot of times it's confused uh, with Botrytis scenario. Um, so if you have botrytis, it's more of a like a grayish green. If you see that salmon color on the fruit, um, you're most likely dealing with anthracnose. Um, so distinct dark sunken lesions may form on petioles, uh, runners, and crowns. So these meat lesions may cause daughter plants to die, uh, elder leaves to die prematurely, uh, or the plant may collapse from crown rot. So infected crowns when cut lengthwise are discolored, 
with reddish brown streaks creating a marbled effect. Um, infections during bloom result in dead dried up flowers or small hard dried up fruit. Um, so this is kind of the disease cycle. Um, so the primary source of uh, anthracnose inoculum enters the field on strawberry transplants. Uh, the pathogen can grow in green tissue, even without showing any symptoms, uh, then remain inactive or even produce spores. When the green tissue dies, the fungus becomes active and can, can produce many spores. Um, so C. acutatum uh, has been reported to survive in soil and plant debris for up to nine months. And uh, it may infect weeds growing alongside the field as well. Um, so the canidia are produced in abundance on petioles, runners, and fruits, and are dispersed through rain splash, um, especially when wind-driven rain. Uh, movement of machinery and workers through the field also may um, contribute to inoculum spread. Warm human conditions um, are usually optimal for this disease. Um, thus, cultural practice that encourage aeration and rapid drying of fruit should be used. Um, Uh, a little bit about um, disease management. Um, so there's a few things you can do uh, to try to avoid this pathogen. So you use disease-free planting material, um, monitor, uh, rotate, and then you have uh, chemical or biological control. Um, so rarely does anthracnose occur year after year on the same farm in annual production systems. Uh, so the disease has been associated with asymptomatic plants um, imported from transplant supply nurseries. Um, so it can originate from wild um, species as, um, as well. Um, thus, the use of disease-free plants is the most important management strategy for controlling this disease. So currently, um, there's no reliable protocol to sample plants and detect the pathogen to declare all plants anthracnose-free. Um, so plants have reduced risk of disease um, if they've been micropropagated and then entered into a strict plant certification program managed by a third party or by the nursery operation. Um, so periodic scouting of a field, especially during warm and wet weather, um, will enable early detection of anthracnose. So if the problem seems to be associated with hot spots in the field, um, you should remove and destroy. So either bury or burn infected, infected plants and surrounding plants in, in a five to 10 foot radius. Killing the plants with herbicide will initiate spore production by the pathogen. And if these plants are not removed, the problem will be aggravated. Um, so a few things you can do, uh, do not work plants when they're wet, um, do not perform hand sanitation work in the early spring, like removing dead leaves and pulling weeds if it's um, known to be present. Um, and then you can, there's rotation. So rotation of strawberries for two or three years will help to rid the field of inoculum from infected plant tissue or infested debris in the soil. However, um, it does not commonly reappear a second year in a field unless the disease is reintroduced on contaminated plants or if plants from the previous year persist on the farm over the summer. Um, therefore, all plants should be killed when harvest is done um, if uh, anthracnose fruit rot was present. Um, so fungicides play a major role in the management of this disease. Uh, fungicide applications are critical in problem fields during early and full bloom. These fungicides are targeted to limit the buildup of the pathogen, even though symptoms are usually not visible. Um, so in research tests, the bloom sprays are critical. So if anthracnose is known to be present, um, don't wait to see fruit symptoms before applying an, uh, an um, an effective fungicide. Um, if fungicides are applied beginning when the first anthracnose symptoms occur on the fruit, uh, then control will be poor uh, initially since it takes 10 to 14 days to slow down um, an epidemic and protect new fruit. Um, so the main fungicides um, that are used to control um, anthracnose are the um, respiration inhibitors, particularly the, the quinone outside inhibitors or QOI. Um, are the most commonly used for anthracnose control. Um, so there's, there's two chemicals, um, azoxystrobin. Um, we, we, I don't think we have a product called Abound. Um, they have it in the US, but azoxystrobin is part of a lot of um, uh, fungicide tank mixes with other products. 
um, pyroclostrobin would be more commonly known in this, this region, uh, which is cabrio. Um, so cabrio is, is probably your most effective control of, um, of anthracnose. Uh, so fungicide resistance. Um, so fungicide resistance um, usually occurs due to, to two common mutations that occur um, in the population um, after exposure um, to um, these QOI fungicides over a prolonged period of time. Um, so one is the F129L mutation, which causes partial resistance um, in the population. And the other is the G143A mutation, uh, which actually causes um, complete resistance. So the QOIs have been registered uh, for anthracnose control on strawberry for several decades. So the, um, the, the intensive use of such of these, fun of these fungicides has led to the selection of um, colototricum accutatum populations that are resistant to QOI fungicides. Um, so a loss of sensitivity to QOI fungicides and fungicide exposed isolates of a hundred fold or greater compared to non exposed baseline samples is often a sign that the G143 mutation is present. Um, so the G143 mutation has been reported in many pathogens across Europe, Asia, and North America. Um, so it, it's common in a lot of um, uh, pathogen species, um, not just anthracnose. So um, Botrytis also um, can get this G143A mutation. Um, so the experimental objectives um, for this project um, were to conduct radial growth experiments on approximately 10 isolates of anthracnose uh, collected across 10 fields to determine the level of resistance um, to the, the group 11 fungicides, the QOIs, using Cabrio, and to use the results to guide the strawberry industry in, in more um, effective disease management strategies. Uh, given the change, given the changing climate and risk of resistance, um, so uh, materials and methods. Um, so whole plants or petiole cuttings were selected from various farms from June uh, to July 2023 uh, in the Annapolis Valley region that appeared to have necrotic lesions. Um, so several plants were collected uh, from each farm and positively identified as anthracnose or discarded. So in total, 10 monoconidial isolates um, belonging to the species complex were isolated from anthracnose uh, affected strawberry petioles and used in this study. Um, single spores were collected from each sample and grown on potato dextrose agar for several days. Um, and then um, uh, basically um, isolates were considered sensitive uh, to pyroclostrobin um, or the, um, the cabrio, um, if, if, um, if, if, um, 50% of the mycelial growth was inhibited compared to the control. Um, so if, if 50% was inhibited, um, using the, the three microgram per milliliter concentration, it was considered partial resistance. And if 50% of the mycelial growth was inhibited compared to the control um, when 100 milligrams or micrograms per milliliter um, were applied, it was considered um, complete control. Um, and then this experiment was done in, in triplicate. Um, so these are the results um, of the samples. So we had the 10 samples. Um, one sample was actually from Apple, um, just to kind of take a look um, as a comparison. Um, we, we didn't actually find um, any resistance um, uh, when three micrograms per milliliter or 100 micrograms per milliliter were applied. Um, we started to see uh, a trend towards resistance. Um, so um, we saw that um, um, we would get up to about 36% uh, inhibition uh, at three micrograms um, per milliliter of, um, of, of cabrio in, in some isolates, but it, it wasn't enough to reach that 50% um, um, inhibition. 
um, or, or non-inhibition, which would which would be the cause of, of resistance. Um, so we can't say that there was resistance in, the, in these isolates, just that uh, they were possibly trending towards uh, resistance. Um, yeah, so among the 10 isolates tested, all were sensitive to pyroclostrobin at both the three microgram per mil and 100 microgram per mil level. And then several of the isolates um, showed some uh, growth on the three microgram per mil plates. Uh, with mean values between 4.9% inhibition and 33.6% inhibition. Um, so this is just a, a look at um, the isolates. So you can see um, the picture on the left, we basically have complete inhibition at three microgram per mil, which is the middle plate, and 100 microgram per mil, which is the far right plate. Um, and then on the picture on the right, um, you can actually see the middle plate, um, three microgram per mil. We, we are seeing some growth, um, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not enough to say that um, that resistance is occurring. Um, so there's a number of registered products um, uh, that should be used as part of a complete spray, spray program um, through the appropriate growth stages. Um, so we have um, a number of products that you can see there um, that can be used for, um, for control of anthracnose. Um, if anybody's interested in um, developing a spray schedule that doesn't have one anymore or, 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 or doesn't have one or, or wants to, uh, to improve their spray schedule, um, Sunny would definitely be the person to, to talk to about something like that. Um, so it's June bearing spray got pro, uh, guidelines. So pre-bloom, um, two applications of Bravo, um, max applications are three of year, a year, um, which is primarily for botrytis at bloom, Captain or full Pam, uh, Miravis or Miravis Prime. At harvest, uh, rotate through Miravis Prime, switch in Diplomat, and pay particular attention to Annapolis, Cavendish, Kent, and Myra varieties, uh, which could be more susceptible. Um, for ever bearing, um, two applications of Bravo um, at pre bloom uh, through harvest, rotate through Miravis switch, and the group 11 uh, with Captain Maestro and Diplomat. And keep in mind that Diplomat needs a tank mix partner for powder and mildew and botrytis control. Uh, during the summer rest period, rely on Captain Maestro. Um, and watch all everbearing varieties uh, while Albion is less susceptible. Uh, use Quadras Top, Pristine, Luna, Cabrio, Narabon through harvest, but during periods that are less conducive to anthracnose infection. Uh, if harvest timing allow, um, these products should be mixed with Group M products. Uh, safe switch application for periods of weather and crop stage, stages that are particularly conducive to anthracnose infection, and never apply Group 11 fungicides sequentially. Um, so resistance testing. Uh, sorry. Um, so there was a few other um, studies where they had done um, um, similar studies. So one was um, for Cellini et al. in 2016. Um, they conducted similar mycelial growth experiments using pyroclostrobin and azoxystrobin on 54 isolates collected in Florida. Uh, from 2012 uh, to 2015, um, and they found that 43 isolates were inhibited greater than 50% compared to the control. Um, so the average EC50 values were 28.38 micrograms per mil for azoxystrobin uh, and 1.43 micrograms per mil for pyroclostrobin. Um, so in this uh, experiment that was conducted in Florida, um, for 2012 to 2015, they actually found that the majority of the isolates um, that they had tested um, were, were resistant um, to, um, uh, to um, class 11 fungicides. Um, however, they noted that the majority of resistant isolates originated from only three nurseries, um, leading them to believe that resistance is still not widespread and is linked to plant source. 
um, and they um, um, so they considered um, the same um, they considered um, pyroclostrobin concentrations up to three micrograms per mil um, as or sorry as oxystrobin concentrations up to three micrograms per mil and pyroclostrobin concentrations up to um, 0 0.11 micrograms per mil were sensitive um, isolates um, that showed resistance up to 100 micrograms per mil for azoxystrobin and 10 micrograms per mil um, for, for pyroclostrobin were considered moderately resistant. And then anything that showed greater resistance than that at higher concentrations were considered uh, completely resistant. Um, and then there was a study by Forcellini and Perez in 2018 that tested 232 um, monoconidial isolates uh, belonging to the, the Colototricum acutatum species complex um, collected from nurseries in California, North Carolina, um, and from uh, production fields in California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, North Carolina, and Virginia from 2015 to 2016. Um, so what they actually found, um, they did the same thing. They, they looked at um, three micrograms per mil uh, was considered um, moderate resistance. And um, if they survived on 100 micrograms per mil or 50% uh, had less than 50% inhibition, then they were um, considered completely resistant. Um, so 16 of 91 isolates were resistant from California. Uh, 40 out of 52 were resistant from Louisiana. Uh, 13 out of 23 were resistant from Georgia. Four, five out of 43 were resistant from Virginia. And five out of 14 um, were resistant from uh, North Carolina. So they noted that the majority of plants harboring um, QOI resistant isolates originated from nurseries whose spray programs exceeded the product recommendations. Um, suggesting that there may be a link between nursery spray program um, and frequency of resistance. Um, because transplants produced in large nurseries are sold to smaller ones, plants may be exposed to multiple um, fungicide applications in each phase of propagation. Um, so we can see here um, with these results that um, it's a little more varied. So um, only 16 and 91 um, isolates from California were resistant. Um, but comparatively 40 out of 52 from Louisiana. So it seems like um, resistant pockets are kind of uh, spread out and we, we don't really have complete resistance in the population um, quite yet. Um, so they, they had an interesting graph um, that I took. Um, so they, they had collected um, um, 11 of the isolates they collected have been off crown root tissue 187 off fruit and flower tissue, um, and 34 were off petiole tissue. Um, so the interesting thing to note was the majority of the resistant isolates um, that they actually found were on fruit and flowers. So when you look at the frequency of resistant isolates, crown and root, or, or petioles, it's actually really low. So the majority of the isolates are still sensitive um, to the fungicide. Um, so that kind of made me curious if, if we're dealing with a case of um, maybe there's um, the different species of, of um, colototricum that I talked about earlier, um, maybe infecting different parts of the, of the strawberry plant. And we're seeing um, resistance in some populations, um, but not resistance in others. Um, so someone actually looked at um, the different isolates of, um, of colototricum. So uh, weighing it all in 2019, um, they conducted phylogenetic analysis on 217 isolates of colototricum SPP um, collected in Florida over a 23 year period um, and found that 212 of the 217 uh, isolates belonged um, to one um, genus uh, or one species, sorry, uh, colototricum nymphae uh, with the rest being Colototricum uh, fiorinae. Um, interestingly, they found that disease severity among isolates of um, Colototricum nymphae was, was quite a bit higher 
um, than colototricum uh, fiorna. So it kind of shows that there's a, a difference in aggressiveness between these species. Um, so potentially there may be a difference in, um, in um, fungicide resistance um, in these populations as well. Um, so you can kind of see here, this is a, a, a photo that they had um, where you can kind of see on the top, uh, we have the um, Colototricum nymphae isolates. Um, and then on the bottom, we have the, the Colototricum uh, fiorinae isolates. Um, so you can actually kind of see a distinct um, difference between the two morphologically. So the, the Colototricum nymphae, they, they kind of appear more yellow. Uh, and um, the one, the Colototricum uh, fiorinae kind of appear uh, more of like a pinkish. Um, that they're not so. So there, there is a way probably to to tell the difference between these these species morphologically um, by looking at the plates um, and and also the 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 spores that they produce um, very slightly. Um, so it's possible to detect the difference. Um, in these species by their spores as well. Um, so for future work, um, I want to test more isolates collected across the province. I, I kind of feel like 10 um, localized in one area may not give a realistic um, depiction of resistance, so the state of resistance in the population. So um, a lot of these other studies, they tested um, um, over 200 isolates. Um, because certain certain areas, like we we had seen previously, certain areas like California, um, the number of resistant isolates was very low, whereas in Louisiana they were very high. So I, I think it's um, important to test um, a greater number of isolates across the province, um, because there may be pockets where resistance is high, and we're simply missing those. So I don't want to say um, that we all of the Anthracnose um, in the province is susceptible um, to fungicides just because we, we weren't seeing any resistance. Um, all I can say definitively is that out of those 10 isolates, um, we, we didn't see any resistance, but it appeared that resistance was beginning to develop. Um, but I'd like to test a lot more isolates to actually flesh that idea out. Um, test a wider range of concentrations of pyroclostrobin, so the cabrio fungicide. Um, so um, what I have found from the research is that um, pyroclostrobin or cabrio is, is much more effective at controlling um, anthracnose at lower levels um, compared to azoxystrobin. So the azoxystrobin kind of ranged um, um, but about 30 or so micrograms per milliliter was effective in controlling um, um, the, the fungus and then anything over that was kind of considered resistant. Whereas with, with pyroclostrobin, um, that was about tenfold lower. Um, so we were seeing about like two micrograms per milliliter was effective, uh, for controlling anthracnose and then anything over that level, um, you could kind of consider resistance. So where I tested, um, three micrograms per milliliter, hundred micrograms per milliliter, um, it might be that those concentrations are, are way too high. Um, and the only thing I would see is complete resistance um, from the G143A mutation, but I wouldn't pick up um, partial resistance um, from the F129L um, mutation because my, my range of concentrations wasn't, wasn't high enough. Um, I'd also want to collect samples across the petioles, flowers, crowns, and fruit. Um, so as I mentioned, I had only collected um, um, isolates from petioles. And, and we saw from um, the research that was done by Forcellini and Perez in 2018 that um, depending on the tissue where the isolate was taken, the resistance levels varied a lot. So on the fruit, um, you, had, you tend to have a lot of resistant isolates um, to um, the class 11 fungicides, whereas um, the crowns and the petioles um, they still tended to be more susceptible. So I don't know if that's uh, because the species are different or if there's, if there's something else going on, but it would be nice to be able to collect across these different tissues and make a comparison. 
Um, and that kind of leads to the other part is to conduct a multi-locus sequence analysis of isolates or use the spore plate morphology to determine species of Colototricum SVP. I, I'd be curious to see if um, certain species of Colototricum are, are more commonly present on some of these tissues um, than others. And that's why we're seeing um, potentially resistance in some populations and not resistance in others. At, at least from Forcellini and Perez's work, we haven't found any um, resistance in this province yet, but um, it, would, it would show quite a uh, more complete picture. Um, so that, that's kind of it. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway is that we're not seeing um, resistance um, to class 11 fungicides um, in the province from the isolates that were te tested. Um, but keep in mind that um, the number of isolates that were tested um, was relatively low. Um, the geographical area um, was relatively small, so just the Annapolis Valley region. Um, and we also need to potentially um, expand um, those fungicide concentrations to pick up um, potential um, moderate resistance from the F129 L mutation. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them.